I'd like to welcome you to the dedication of the World War II Memorial. My name is Doug Saturno, and I've had the honor of serving as chairman of the World War II Committee for the last six years. Let me uh, begin by expressing my gratitude to all World War II veterans for their heroism. They are the reason for our freedom, and we greatly appreciate that they have what they have done for our nation. After World War II, General Jonathan Wainwright, a Walla Walla native, asked for a memorial to be built honoring his men. A promise to fulfill his request has now been made. Although 73 years have passed since he made his request, it finally has been fulfilled. One of the key factors to initiate this project was a 1946 publication found by Joe Drazen at a yard sale for 25 cents, which listed all the men killed in action. After extensive research of these soldiers by Sherilyn and Neil Jacobson, they compro comprised a short biography for each of the war lost. And their biography, along with a photo, was published in a brochure. It is with respect that a hundred years ago today, the World War I guns went silent. And on September 2nd, 1945, 73 years ago, World War II came to an end. It is a great privilege to celebrate Veterans Day and the fulfillment of a promised monument. My part of this project was to design the memorial and I'll share a few of the details. As you notice, the memorial, the monument, is similar to the one in World War II Memorial in Washington, D.C. Each massive column weighs over 30,000 pounds. The granite was quarried in New England, and the monument was built by O.M. Stone of Hillsboro, Oregon. The three columns are representative of those who fought on the land the sea, and in the air. The large bronze star in the center of the monument honors the men for their heroism. And the keystone in the middle states this. A promise kept. No one dies unless they are forgotten. In honor of the heroic men and women from Walla Walla County who served in World War II 1941 to 1945, dedicated November 11, 2018. I would like to personally thank the World War II Committee for their dedication and their hard work. At this time, I'd like to introduce each committee member and their military branch that they served in. Please hold your applause until the end, and I'll read their following names. Neil Jacobson, he was uh, Marine Corps, and he was the project manager. Would you stand, please, Neil? Larry Adams, Marine Corps, retired. Alan Apples, Army Reserve, retired. Alan, where's Alan? He's back hiding. Thank you, Alan. Larry Cunnington, Navy. Jerry Davis, Army, retired. Jonathan Follett, Army. Sherilyn Jacobson was the only rose in the thorn bush. Um, I have to say a special thank you to Sherilyn for all the work that she put in, all the time and effort, all the letters, and all the details, all the minutes. She's, she's a saint, and she's Army Reserve and National Guard retired. I want to thank her very much. William Lake, 
Navy World War II. Yay! James Bain. Where's James? He's in the back escorting. Okay. Don Schock, Iron Fo Air Force retired. Don. And our, our liaison members, Andy Coleman, Parks and Rec Department, City of Walla Walla. Jim Johnson, Walla Walla County Commissioner. And, and members at large, um, we'd like to say thank you to Jerry Zoll. Please stand, Jerry. And we'd, we'd like to also remember uh, Pete Reed and Theron Smith. So thank you all for your efforts. In a moment, I'm going to ask you to rise for the colors by the Walla Walla High School Junior ROTC and remain standing for the national anthem sung by Roberta Bardsley from the AMVETS Auxiliary. And following the anthem, Chaplain Lieutenant Colonel Walter Hutchinson will offer prayer. All right, if you would all please stand for the colors. Order, arms, inwards, face, color guard, fall out. Please be seated. At, 
At this time, Lieutenant Colonel Hutchinson will now introduce the attending World War II veterans. Our dear Father in heaven, we bow before thee as thy children, giving thanks for our great country, a nation founded with thy blessings and under thy guidance. We ask for further blessings on this day that has been set aside as a day of remembrance. Wilt thou fill our hearts with sweet remembrances of the great service and blessings of thy Son, Jesus Christ, for all mankind, and to remember and cherish deep in our hearts the great sacrifices of our valiant warriors who answered the call to arms in the times of national crises who placed themselves in harm's way to protect us and our way of life. For they surely followed the footsteps of thy Son, Jesus Christ, and showed forth a greater love by laying down their lives for their friends. Now as we dedicate this monument in their memory as a token of our love and appreciation for them, we pray for a renewed faith in thee, that we may be assured in our hearts and minds that they are at peace and dwell in a glory that is free from the fears and turmoil they endured for us in the battlefields far, far from home and loved ones. May we live to be worthy of and to revere the gift of freedom brought by their sacrifice for us. Our nation is now in great turmoil, filled with hate and greed, almost in complete defiance and rejection of thee and thy ways, which are the only way to peace and freedom. Please, Father, help us to turn our hearts again to thee, Help us to remember that we are thy children and to remember our national heritage and to one of those faithful brothers and sisters who have served so valiantly in the long ago past, as well as those who are now serving in the military, police, firemen, and all the brave and dedicated first responders to protect and save us. Also, we ask thee to bless all of those patriots who spent so many hours planning and creating this monument to our heroes. And we wish to remember the wives and the families of all of those who have served, who also served, who have waited. In the sacred name of Jesus Christ, amen. Now we would like to recognize and honor. I'm sorry. When we think of the great sacrifices that you made for us. We are moved to tears. Warren Gage, Army. Is this worth it? If you're able to stand, do so. Otherwise, wave so we know who you are. I said Warren Gage. Tom Copeland, Army. <laughs> Al Marion Morrison. Morrison. Thank you, Al. Don Hayes.
Don Hayes. Very good. Ken Nichols, Air Force. Ed Meister, Navy and Army. Thank you. Sir. Newt Zanes, United States Marine Corps. Chuck Nelson, Navy. Arthur Krebs, Air Force. Thank you. Emilio Gugliamelli, Junior. <laughs> Joe Towner, Navy Air. <laughs> and Bill Browner. Bill Browner. We would like to also recognize the families of the fallen. If any of you are here, please stand. Give them a round of applause. And we want to recognize all of the veterans who are here. Would you please stand? Thank you very much. At this time, I'd like to read the list of the in-kind donors. This project would not have been possible without the generosity of these businesses. Accurate Concrete Construction. American Rock Products. And Bets Post 1111. Sherbonnell Construction Company, <laughs> Columbia Electric Supply, <laughs> Fort Walla Walla Museum, <laughs> Holly's Flowers, <laughs> Home Depot, <laughs> Humbert Asphalt and Rock, Integrity Design, Concrete Industries, Marino and Nelson Construction, Narum Concrete Construction, Pacific Power, PBS Engineering and Environmental, 
Pronto House, Rock Hill Concrete, Smith Brothers Landscaping, and Walla Walla Electric. Our keynote speaker today is Colonel Kelly Taylor, U.S. Army, retired. And uh, here's a little biography of Colonel Taylor. Upon graduating from Oregon Health Sciences University Dental School in 1986, Colonel retired Kelly Taylor began his 20-year Army career serving as an officer in the U.S. Army Dental Corps. Upon retiring in 2006, he moved to Walla Walla along with his wife, Susan and three of their six children. Colonel Taylor began his Army career at Fort Carson, Colorado, where he was a resident in the Army's Advanced Education Program in General Dentistry. After a tour in the Netherlands in support of the Allied Forces Central Europe, he returned to the States for additional military training at Fort Sam Houston, Texas, and served as the Director of Dental Services at Dungway, Proving Grounds in Utah. While there, he was selected as residency training for a specialty of prosthodontics at Walter Reed Army Medical Center in Washington, D.C. Upon completion of that program in 1995, he obtained his board certification in prosthodontics while serving at Schofield Barracks, Hawaii. He subsequently served tours at Fort Lewis, Washington, and again at Fort Carson, Colorado, where he served in a variety of administration assignments while practicing and teaching in the Army's residency program. Dr. Taylor is currently in private practice here in Walla Walla. I'd like to welcome Colonel Taylor. Thank you. Today we're gathered to honor the 3,800 men and women from our community who served in the military during World War II. Right up front, I want to give a special thanks to uh, Neil and Sherilyn Jacobson for the research that they have provided for a special group of these service members from our community those who made the ultimate sacrifice. Because of their research, people like me who weren't around during the Second World War are able to learn a little bit about them. Special thanks also goes to the staff at the Union Bulletin who published their work. As I have read the stories of those from our community who made the ultimate sacrifice, I have come to share the sentiment that this memorial is long overdue. Thank you to all of you who have made this monument in their honor possible. I feel a special honor today to be in the presence of some who served during World War II. You are part of what has been called the greatest generation and in my mind, you served in the greatest war. If there is anything that's truly exceptional about our nation, I believe it was made manifest in your generation by the way they responded to the worldwide threat to freedom that made this war necessary. By some estimates at the beginning of the war, the strength of our military ranked just 17th or 18th in the world. And after Pearl Harbor, the backbone of our Navy in the Pacific was broken. Yet we emerged from this war with the greatest military power the world had ever known. And in a world war that literally did involve almost every nation, we emerged as the leader. And we remain in that position today. Thank you to all of you for what you have done for us.
now I would like to focus on those 90 individuals who are in that special group from our community who made the ultimate sacrifice during the war. Through their story, we're able to get a sense of how Walla Walla was, our county, was represented throughout the world during the war. And we can gain an appreciation for the magnitude of the challenges that they faced. I wish we had the time to say a few words about each of them individually. Their names will be read later as we honor them individually. But what I hope to communicate right now is that while they were ordinary men like you and me, they answered the call to serve, and they did it with honor. They became first-rate soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines. Thirty-three of them died in battles on land. Ten of them died at sea. Eighteen of them died in combat in the air. Another twelve lost their lives in aviation accidents unrelated to combat. Aviation was not the safe venture then that it is today. Another three lost their lives in other accidents. Six of them died in captivity. And for eight of them, we just don't know the circumstances of their death. Our involvement in the war in the Pacific began with the attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941. In that attack, we lost two individuals from our community. One was one of the 1,177 individuals who lost their lives with the sinking of the USS Arizona. That was half of all the deaths that we suffered that day. The other lost his life in the attack on Hickam Airfield that same day. Less than three months later, the largest ship that we had in the Far East, the USS Houston, which was commanded by a member of our community, Albert Rooks, entered a narrow passage between the islands of Java and Sumatra in the Dutch East Indies along with another Australian ship, the HMS Perth. When they entered this narrow passage, which was called the Sundra Strait, they encountered more than 50 Japanese transports escorted by eight destroyers and one cruiser. Against great odds, they engaged the enemy and inflicted some damage. But the ultimate result was that both the Houston and the Perth were sunk. And among the 696 Americans that lost their lives in that battle was Navy Captain Albert Brooks. For his valor in that action, he was awarded the Medal of Honor. In the in the weeks following the attack on Pearl Harbor, the Japanese attacked other U.S. territories in the Philippines and Guam, among other islands in the South Pacific. Our initial efforts in the war were largely defensive, and our efforts to defend the Philippines ended with surrender in the Bataan Peninsula. Some of you may have heard of the Bataan Death March. The Japanese took 76,000 prisoners and forced them to march 60 miles under the blazing sun to a new POW camp without any water or food. There were 12,000 Americans among them. 5,000 of them lost their lives in that march. During the battle for the Bataan Peninsula, MacArthur had, had relocated the Allied headquarters to an island nearby called Corregidor. After the fall of the peninsula, Corregidor was invaded and it fell on May 6th of 18, 1942. And with the fall of Corregidor, another 15,000 prisoners were taken. Four of them were members of our community. A turning point in the war came with the Battle of Midway. In that battle, we were able to sink four Japanese carriers, a pretty significant feat. But in the process, we lost the USS Yorktown, and along with that ship, another individual from our community. 
In the latter months of 42 and the early months of 1943, three more individuals from our community lost their lives in what was the first major offensive mission against the Japanese in the Pacific. It was our effort to liberate the Solomon Islands. We lost individuals on the island of New Georgia and Guadalcanal. That was a bloody battle in that 7,100 allies were killed, but the Japanese lost about 31,000 men in that effort. In the summer of 1944, we lost another four from our community in our efforts to liberate the Mariana Islands, which included Saipan, Tinian, and the U.S. territory of Guam. Our liberation of the Philippines began in uh, late 1944. Between the months of October of that year and December of the following year, we lost eight more individuals from our community. When you add to that total the four who were taken captive with the fall of Corregidor, who never returned from the war, we lost more individuals from our community in the Philippines than in any other single nation during the war. In early 1945, we lost two men with the invasion of Iwo Jima. Iwo Jima was the bloodiest battle for our Marine Corps during the war. In that effort, 6,822 U.S. soldiers were killed and another 20,000 were wounded. But again, the Japanese lost three times that number of men. In April of 1945, we invaded Okinawa. We needed Okinawa to be able to stage the invasion of Japan, should that become necessary. In that 82-day battle, we lost 12,500 men. Three of them were from our community. And we lost two more in the bombing raids on Japan before Japan surrendered in August of 1945. Our engagement with the German forces didn't begin until November of 1942. It began with what was called Operation Torch, the invasion of North Africa. We lost four individuals in battles related to that operation, and one more just after in the invasion of Sicily. We lost two individuals in Italy, one after the invasion of Anzio and another one later in the war during the battle for Italy. On uh, June 6th of 1944, we began Operation Overlord, which was the invasion of Normandy. In that effort, which lasted, lasted several weeks, we lost another individual from our community, and after that, four more in battles throughout France. In September of 44, the Allies launched Operation Market Garden. This was a mission to capture a series of bridges in the Netherlands that would secure a passage into the Ruhr area of Germany, which was the heart of their industry. In that effort, we lost one individual. That mission failed when the British were unable to capture the last bridge, the one at Arnhem, which has come to be known as the Bridge Too Far. The failure of that operation dampened any hopes that the war would be over by Christmas. But if there was any hope left at all, it was dashed when the Germans launched their unexpected counteroffensive through the Ardennes forest region of uh, Belgium, northern France, and, and Luxembourg. This we know is the Battle of the Bulge. The Battle of the Bulge was the deadliest and largest battle for U.S. forces in World War II. In that battle, there were 89,000 casualties, 19,000 of them soldiers who were killed. From our community, there were two. Before the surrender of Germany in May of 1945, 10 more members of our 
community would lose their lives in battles throughout that country. There were others lost in that side of the world. We lost two in the North Sea, one in the South, in, in the Pacific, in the Atlantic Ocean near South Africa. We lost one in the Zoider Sea of the Netherlands, one in India, one in a plane crash over the Himalayas, and one in a plane crash in England. In our day, we're not accustomed to losses of the magnitude that we saw in World War II. In all, the United States military lost 416,800 men and women, 90 of them from our community. In my mind, they were all heroes. But in those, among those 90 from our community, there were some who were awarded the highest honors that the military gives for valor in combat. We've already talked about Albert Rooks, who was awarded the Medal of Honor for his heroics in the Battle of Sundra Strait. That is the highest honor that can be awarded for, com for valor in combat. In the Army, the second highest honor is the Distinguished Service Cross. And in the Navy and the Marine Corps, it was the Navy Cross. Two individuals from our community were awarded the Distinguished Service Cross. Private Stanley F. Bates for heroics in a battle for an airstrip on the island of New Georgia in the Solomon Islands. And Sergeant Jacob Gradwall, who perished in a plane crash during Operation Tidal Wave, which was a costly operation for the Air Corps where in an effort to bomb oil refineries in Romania, they lost 53 aircraft and 660 men. The thing about Sergeant Gradwall was that he had 27 combat missions under his belt when he began this operation. He was eligible to return to states. After 25 combat missions, the Air Corps was eligible to return to the states, but he had chose not to do that. We also had two members from our community who were awarded the Navy Cross. Pharmacy mate, third class, Ivan L. Munns, and Lieutenant Vance C. Pruitt. Oh. Lieutenant Pruitt died in, in captivity as a prisoner of war. Ivan Munns was shot by a sniper on Iwo Jima as he was trying to rescue a fallen Marine. He had already rescued four others. The third highest honor for valor in combat is the Silver Star. We had three individuals from our community receive that honor. The first was Lieutenant Colonel Harold I. Misnoy. We also had Tech Sergeant Jackson D. McMahon and First Lieutenant Anthony Lloyd. Colonel Misnoy was awarded the Silver Star for heroics in combat four months before he was killed on the island of Saipan. Tech Sergeant McMahon died while, while trying to rescue some fellow crewmen who had lost their oxygen supply as their B-17 was flying at high altitude. In the process of trying to rescue them, he too lost his air supply and ultimately died. <laughs> Lieutenant Lloyd was one of those four who were taken captive with the fall of Corregidor in the Philippines early in the war, never to return home. In a letter to the mother of Private Chester Smith from Walla Walla, who had posthumously been awarded the Bronze Medal for heroic achievement against the enemy, an officer who served with him wrote the following, the loss of a loved one is beyond man's repairing and the medal is of slight value. Not so, however, the message it carries. We are all comrades in arms in this battle for our country, and those of us who have gone are not and will not ever be forgotten by those of us who remain. As I read this, I was struck with the knowledge that this is the reason why we need this monument. Whatever 
that monument is worth, and it is beautiful, that pales in comparison to what it represents. And that is that those from our community who gave their lives in the service of their country during this war should never be forgotten by the rest of us. And I want to use the words of Franklin D. Roosevelt himself in a letter to the uh, family of Joseph Mosner. Those who died in the service of their country stand in an unbroken line of patriots who dared to die that freedom might live and grow and increase its blessings. Freedom lives and through it, they live in a way that humbles the undertakings of most men. In my mind, these words say all that needs to be said about those to whom we pay tribute today. So at this time, we're going to read the Cadgesley roster, and at this time I don't like to introduce Joe Wynn, who will read the first series of names. And uh, all in combat. Now the list on the casualty, I have to tell you, they were my age group, so many I remember. Well, Sergeant Gideon F. Eichley, Army. Private First Class Michael R. Alessio, Army. Staff Sergeant William A. Bacon, Army Air Corps. Private Donald J. Baker, Army. Chief Captain's Mate Walter B. Ball, CB. Private Stanley F. Bates, Army National Guard. First Lieutenant Abel Bowman, Jr., Army Air Corps. I also grew up with him. Sergeant Kenneth E. Bridgham, Marine Corps. Private Gerald O. Brumbach, Army. Corporal William E. Bueller, Marine Corps Reserve. Aviation Cadet James L. Burnett, Army Air Corps. Staff Sergeant Irvin E. Burns, Army Air Corps. Private Craig F. Campbell, Army. Private First Class Carlson Crisco, Army. Staff Sergeant Armand W. Connery, Army National Guard. Second Lieutenant William H. Cooper, Army Air Corps. Captain Dwayne L. Cosper, Army. Captain Benson Coyle, Army. Second Lieutenant Clarence W. Dye, Army Air Corps. Boiler Man Second Class, Robert R. Deneen, Navy. Private First Class, Will Wendell L. Downs, Army. And it's been an honor for me to be able to read their names. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Now I'd like to introduce Tom Copeland, who will read the second series of names. Thank you. Thank you. Merle S. Eaton, Army Air Corps. Kent Eikenbury, National Guard. Captain Norman Estes, Army. Staff Sergeant Abram Ferris, Army. Sergeant Gordon Fisher, Air Corps. Second Lieutenant Wendell Fogarty, Air Corps. Aviation Mechanic Francis Fries, Navy. Uh, Second Lieutenant Loris C. Gale, Air Corps, Hospital Apprentice uh, Jackson Gillen, Navy, Technician 4th Grade Thomas Glassbar, Air Corps, Second Lieutenant Don Gogol, Air Corps, Private First Class Roy Gogol, Army, Technician 4th Grade John Goodman, Army, Private Johnny Gordon, Air National Guard. Ensign Harold L. Gravel, Navy. Sergeant 
Jacob Gravel, Army Air Corps. First Lieutenant Robert Gunther, Army Air Corps. Second Lieutenant Warren W. Gunther, Army Air Corps. Private Joe Elroy Gwynn, Army. Captain Walter Guthridge, Army. And Sergeant Frank W. Harvey, uh, Hardy Hanna, Army. Thank you. And uh, now Captain Brent Vance, Army Corps Engineers, will read the final names. Yeoman Third Class, Oliver D. Hastings, Navy. Staff Sergeant Frederick A. Hesser, Army Air Corps. Private First Class Bert F. Kimes, Army. Seaman First Class Willard D. LaSalle, Navy. Second Lieutenant Merwin L. Lawfer, Army Corps of Engineers. Private William D. Leto, Army. Private First Class Frank Leonetti, Army. Gunnery Sergeant Henry Linker, Marine Corps. First Lieutenant Anthony B. Lloyd, Army Reserve. Second Lieutenant Chester E. Longshore, Marine Corps. Private Clifford Matheson, Army. Private First Class John D. McCarty, Army Air Corps. Staff Sergeant Ronald McFarland, Army National Guard. Aviation Ordnance Men, Second Class, Clifford E. McFarland, Navy Reserve. Technical Sergeant Jackson D. McMahon, Army Air Corps. Private George Miller, Army Air Corps. Lieutenant Colonel Harold I. Mizzoni, Army. Private First Class Owen W. Monger, Army. Aviation Cadet Joseph C. Monser, Army Air Corps. Pharmacist Mate Third Class Ivan L. Munns, Navy Reserve. Corporal Laverne J. Needham, Army Air Corps. Private Orville R. Nix, Army Air Corps. Second Lieutenant Esperin D. Otis, Army Air Corps. First Lieutenant Frederick J. Owens, Army. Private First Class Orrin L. Page, Jr., Army. Private First Class Bobby N. Petticord, Army. First Lieutenant James A. Picard, Army Air Corps. Lieutenant Vance C. Pruitt, Navy Reserve. Seaman Second Class Joseph D. Ram, Navy. Second Lieutenant Hiram A. Rowe, Army Air Corps. Captain Albert H. Rooks, Navy. Private First Class Lauren A. Reynolds Funson, Army. Second Lieutenant Banford L. Russell, Army Air Corps. Private Chester C. Smith, Army. Private First Class Sheldon E. Stiles, Army. Staff Sergeant Thomas A. Thompson, Army. Second Lieutenant Willard A. Transit, Army Air Corps. Private First Class Cheryl J. Chucker, Army. Private Wilbur J. Utter, Army Air Corps. Seaman First Class Vane I. Vanderpool, Navy Reserve. Sergeant Dean E. Van Donge, Army. Private First Class John V. Wasser, Army Air Corps. Flight Officer Charles W. Weaver, Army Air Corps. Second Lieutenant William G. Weaver, Army Air Corps. Staff Sergeant Glenn L. Williams, Army National Guard. Seaman First Class Melvin D. Williamson, Navy. Technical Sergeant William R. Wynn, Army Air Corps. Private First Class Andrew H. Whittle, Army National Guard. And Seaman First Class Leon P. Yenny, Navy Reserve. So at this time, um, the remainder 
the ceremony will be outside. We know it's cold. Um, you're welcome to attend it, or we'll, you're welcome to stay in here. Boy Scout Troop 333 will raise an original 48 star flag. At that time, uh, Captain Vance, Army Corps of Engineers, and Scoutmaster will lead the Pledge of Allegiance. The rifle salute will be presented by the Walla Walla Valley Honor Guard, and taps will be played by Blake Harrison, College Place High School student. You know, today I have to be in the parade, and there was a young lady that came up to me and said, thank you for your service. And it brought home something I tried to tell veterans and my friends for years. Yes, we are the veterans. But you, that were fortunate enough to stay home and pay our dues, raise our children, and whatever made it possible for us to be there. So I brought to mind, as we are here today to dedicate this by memorial to the veterans of World War II. It is not only for our veterans, it is for the mothers, the dads, the girlfriends, and the brothers that never saw their mate again. For that, we want to thank you, those that made it possible for us to be there. Thank you. Join me in saluting for the raising of the colors, the Pledge of Allegiance, the rifle, the ceremony, and tap.
concludes the ceremony. Thank you. Oh, there's one on top. Yeah. 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 Yeah.